There's been a lot of viewers watching the series that I've done on the evolution of the BRICS Trade Alliance and the meeting in Durban, South Africa that just concluded last week and what's come out of it. I'm glad to see there's a lot of interest. I'm glad to see that people are paying attention and I'm glad to see that people are seeking out knowledge so that they can make informed decisions because knowledge is power and ignorance breeds fear. That being said, now that we're embracing, accepting, learning, understanding, beginning to understand what has happened in the Durban, South Africa BRIC Summit. We now need to take that information and we need to look forward. We need to take this information and we need to begin to consider what might be the next likely events that happen in relation to this BRICS development. Specifically, let's consider this. If countries are dealing with the BRIC Trade Alliance, they're going to need gold readily available in order to back these tokens to settle cross-border trade. If countries are in need of buying gold, Kind of to state the obvious here, they're not going to be buying the gold and silver at a volume that you, an individual investor, would be buying to protect your portfolio. They're going to be buying at a nation level volume, if you will. A central bank is not going to buy a thousand ounces of silver. They're just not. They're going to buy pallets. They're going to buy metric tons. They're going to be doing large scale purchases. So if in fact we know that some countries, let's say, let's call it a dozen, okay? a dozen or 15 countries are now moving in the direction of the new BRIC trade alliance and will be using gold to what extent we don't know. And I don't really think it matters. I think what matters is that we understand that central banks are now going to be and have been, by the way, since March 29th of 2019, when the Basel III Bank Accords were put into effect by the Bank of International Settlements. And I would encourage you, Google that phrase, Basel III Bank Accords. If you Google the term Basel III Bank Accords, you will We'll find out that March 29th of 2019, the Bank of International Settlements, for all intents and purposes, reversed what Nixon did in 1971 when he closed the gold window. They put gold back as a tier one, 100% weighted asset in the global banking rules, if you will. And that means for the first time in a half century, as far as the banks and central banks and governments are concerned, for the first time in a half century, 50 years, gold is now once again on par with the dollar and the U.S. Treasury. Think about that for a second. If you're a bank, and for the last 50 years, the only two tier one assets you could hold were U.S. dollars and U.S. Treasuries, and now you can hold gold as a tier 100% weighted asset, it stands to reason that banks are going to move towards gold. Why? One, they're not dollars and they're not treasuries. But two, the dollar nor the treasury have any ability or potential to rise in any meaningful way. Gold, however, certainly does. Now, why do I make that distinction? Because when the housing crash happened, let's not forget the Federal Reserve invented a new thing called quantitative easing. They printed trillions, tens of trillions of dollars of new money and pumped it into the U.S. banks to help their liquidity crisis. Let's, let's say it that way. Trillions of dollars created out of thin air and injected into the economy in under two years. This is a very distorting reality. This is increasing the money supply radically in a very short period of time and distorting the value of everything. And within the next two years, silver went up 500% in value. What do you think the impact would be of central banks buying? This, in my opinion, seems like an absolute no-brainer to get out in front of. What do you think the wave of central bank buying will create as far as an upside potential? In my opinion, silver and gold, for that matter, make perfect sense in the reality that we're going into just as a wealth preservation tool. But if we also understand that large players, central bank size players, are going to be now participating in this market, that's going to bring demand to this market that you have never known in your lifetime of investing as it relates to precious metals, I would argue. There were periods in the late 70s, early 80s, there was the Hunt Brother period, you know, there's been different periods of increased demand for precious metals, but there's never been central bank players coming into the market. It's something to consider. Also something to consider is this. You might be dismissive of this. You might say, well, you know, there's only a dozen or 15 countries in this new BRICS alliance. We don't even know if it's going to get off the ground. We don't know if this will last, if it'll work. I don't think that's the point. I don't think that's the point at all. And let's not just think about the dozen or 15 countries we're talking about in the BRICS trade alliance. Let's consider those countries that are still loyal to the U.S. dollar system, but also geographically 
are dependent upon BRICS nations for some of their trade. These countries too will be forced to buy more precious metals. Think about it. It's not just the dozen or 15 countries. It's going to be dozens upon dozens of countries. Then there's going to be the countries that realize the very thing I'm trying to explain in this video that, hey, if central banks are coming into this market, that's a large player. Those are large purchases that we can foreshadow that are coming. We might want to get ahead of this. Then we start to get into the industrial users of silver. The Sonys, the LGs, the Toshibas, the, you know, the technology companies that make DVD players or washing machines or dishwashers or laptops or cell phones. In case you haven't noticed, everything in this world is becoming digital. Everything in this world is becoming high tech. Think about it. There's a lot of silver that's going to need to be purchased, not to mention all of these green agendas that are going through. Think about this. The UN's Agenda 2030, right? And zero carbon emissions by 2050. And I, there's so much I can't even keep track of it anymore. But the thing you must understand is the only way that these countries are going to get to zero net carbon emissions or whatever the buzz phrases are is if they reduce their dependency on fossil fuels, which means they must shift to renewable energies. Well, right now, there's really, well, there's two. There's two renewable energy sources out there, arguably, that are sizable. There's solar and there's wind. Both use silver heavily. The solar industry, their usage of silver to make solar panels is inconceivably huge. By itself, inconceivably huge. There is a lot of competition coming into a very finite market, silver in this case. So if you're Toshiba or if you're Apple, you need silver for your cell phones, your DVD players, your flat screen TVs. The cell phones that you're carrying around in your pocket on average have four grams of investment grade silver. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, four grams, it's not a whole lot, but think how many billions of cell phones there are on the planet. Think how many laptops there are. Think how many iPads. Can you think of a student in school right now that isn't assigned an iPad at school. Technology's everywhere, and it's becoming more and more ubiquitous as the days go by, which means more silver demand. These are things that you need to think about because moving money into silver bullion not only will serve as a store of value, a wealth protection tool in tumultuous times that may appear, but it also is a very, very extremely undervalued asset, and it's a small, very intimate market. The silver market is insanely small. Any injection of capital into the silver market disproportionately pushes the price higher on a normal day. In this environment, <laughs> it's anyone's guess. The question is, do you want to be calmly positioned in that asset before it catches people's attention and they come running this direction? I would think, yeah. These are things that we need to start considering. We need to start asking what if. We need to start considering what could happen next. If A happens, then B happens. If B happens, what is C? We have to start asking these questions. If you want to stay calm, if you want to be prudent, and if you want to make stable decisions moving forward, you need to start training your brain to think this way. For far too long, for far too long, we've been, I would argue, conditioned to be passive. For far too long, we've gone from rugged individualism in this country to Oh, the government will come save us. That's not at all what the Founding Fathers had in mind when they established the Constitutional Republic. It was about rugged individualism. It was about individual rights. It was about states' rights. And then came the federal government. These are very interesting times. And the people that began to critically examine these times now and start making their best guess at what may come next will be the people that are able to stay calm when the crisis does present itself by simply doing the responsible, prudent thing first. If you like what you see in these videos, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, share it with as many people as you can and help spread the information. Help me help them. I wanna have a conversation with you. I wanna help you understand these things. I wanna help you begin to consider what the future may hold and help you plan accordingly. And if you wanna have that conversation, there's a button below, click it, you can schedule a time convenient for you, and we can have that conversation. The journey of a thousand miles begins with that first step. Take that step.